Welcome back to this week's Master Coaches Wednesday Weekly Buzz. I'm Bob Bertucci, joined by fellow Master Coaches, Vic Haley, Kathy George, and Bill Walton. We have a great show this week. Uh, we have two top Division I coaches from Power Five conferences that we're uh, excited to have on. Uh, one, of the, one of the coaches, our first guest, actually is with the Pac-12, so uh, it, it's only appropriate to have Mick Haley introduce him and uh, start up with our questions. Mick? Hey, thanks, Bob. Uh, it is exciting to have Alfie Reft here, the new head coach at UCLA. Alfie, uh, really appreciate you being on. Congratulations. Uh, um, looking forward to uh, some really good successes and a, and a rebuilt UCLA program, but if I can, I, uh, I'd like to just real quick go through your background because people need to know this is not just a, a, a soft hire. Uh, you know, you were the associate head coach at USD and you had a great run this year. Uh, boy, that team was exciting. That was one of the most fun teams that I've seen in a long time. But you were also at the University of Illinois uh, as an assistant at the University of Minnesota. Uh, you were a professional player for seven years. Uh you um, played at Hawaii and uh, Santa Barbara, and then you've been working as a part-time coach with the USA national women's team for seven or eight years here at least. Uh, I mean, that's quite a resume. So you're not uh, really walking into this and being blindsided by the volleyball. Uh, the only thing that's going to blindside you, I think, are these universities and how you navigate through this stuff. So... We want to ask you some questions real, real straight out. First of all, new job, big problem. You got to hire staff. How do you go about it? What's your philosophy? What have you done so far? Uh, give us the whole thing for UCLA. Yeah, well, first of all, I'm excited to be here, Mick. Uh, thank you guys for having me on. This is an absolute pleasure to be around uh, some really great minds and people who have done this for a long time. But uh yeah, in regards to hiring our staff here, um, you know, I had to really do some deep diving into what my strengths were uh, and some areas that I knew being a first time head coach, um, some of the areas I wanted to shore up and hire to my strengths and as well as some of those areas that I thought I could really learn and be better at. And what was after doing that deep dive and reflection uh, in those areas, what was really evident to me was I needed to get um, people that could connect because that's a big part to me in how I run uh, a team and how I want to run a program is I need people that could connect to our athletes, uh, meet them where they're at. Uh, so when hiring, uh, I wanted dynamic personalities that brought a lot of different facets to coaching and I thought could uh, really reach our athletes in different, different areas. And then <clears throat> I needed two people that were elite in what they did and one being an elite recruiter in Jen Malcolm who was at Iowa State for many years and has run recruiting there with Christy, uh, Christy at that program. And then I needed an elite trainer, someone who was a visionary and didn't necessarily need to have all the chops in the gym because I know that I'm pretty specialized in running a gym. That's been my role for many years, but I needed someone who I could groom a little bit in that area, but had, I thought, the potential and saw the game in a certain way and could articulate and communicate in the gym uh, in a very specific way. And I, I think we found that in Amir Lugo Rodriguez. So uh, again, a top recruiter, an elite recruiter and someone who's I think a great trainer, um, but then more importantly, we're also just elite personalities and could be great connectors for our program. So it looks like the NC2A is going to allow you to now uh, pay a third assistant. Um, have you done anything with that? And where is UCLA going with that? And what's your feeling on a, on a third person uh, besides yourself? Yeah, we're still navigating that, Mick. Um, you know, we have a volunteer assistant in our position in, uh, with Noah Casaquid, and he's, you know, has a nice resume, has coached NAIA, has coached in Division One at USF. And we're still figuring out, um, you know, for us specifically, we, we don't have a full-time Dovo right now. And so we're, we're doing some restructuring of our staffing and 
seeing which people are going to fit in the right seats. So we're not exactly sure where we're going to place NOAA just yet. Um, but I can tell you that we are preparing to hire a third assistant and fund that. Um, it's, we're just not certain on who that's going to be or um, you know, what exactly that looks like. I think the rest of the country is also navigating that that question and how it's funded and how much budget is allotted for that. So uh, I think we're in the thick of that right now. I believe you're only the the third UCLA women's coach in the history. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's pretty mind boggling to me. <laughs> yeah, and and UCLA has been uh, well. If you really count out there, UCLA and Ball State have been the two schools that have produced an alarming number of good coaches out there. Uh, and so you're going away from the traditional reach into the Bruin basket and pull out a bunch of Bruins to back you up here. Uh, in fact, you're a Santa Barbara player, a Hawaii player, um, not much Bruin background there. Do you feel like you need a, a, a Bruin background or are you just going to take the Bruins and, and make them love you? You know, it's really funny, Mick. Like, I grew up an hour north of here. So, while I mean, UCLA actually was the school, like, I wanted to, like, I wanted to go to school here. I grew up in Southern California. So, it's, you grew up around UCLA. I just didn't get into school here. And Al Skates, the men's coach at the time, you know, I was too small at the time to play for You didn't want to be on I the other side that. of the curtain. I was, yeah, I was definitely going to be happy. I was for sure on the other side of the curtain. <laughs> um, but I say that just because... I, I've followed UCLA for my whole life, and so it's really interesting. While I, I didn't attend school here, I've always known of, like, I mean, I used to come watch the women's team play here in 94, 95 with a lot of the greats, with Allison Randick and Jenny Johnson and Annette Buckner, and so I just, I've known of this program and followed it closely for a long time. It, it's almost quite fitting, it feels like, and very full circle to be back here. Um, even though seeing it from a distance now, it's like, nah, it, it feels... It feels very familiar to me. Well, I'll shift gears real quick because other people have got questions. So the, the big question is preseason scheduling. When I say preseason, pre-conference scheduling. Season starts, you've got about eight or nine opportunities to play opponents. Are you going to just use them to build your team? Or are you going to get some Big Ten schools on there to get an idea of what it's going to be like the following year when you guys join the Big Ten? Uh, and was there a schedule previously before you came in that maybe you have to adjust? No, it was a pretty clean slate, actually, when we took the job. And so we had some really quick um, assessing to do of our group. And, you know, with the landscape constantly shifting, uh, bringing in some new pieces, retaining some pieces, and then learning, having to learn quickly, um, what do we got? Like, and projecting out, like, what, where can we see ourselves winning? Uh, that was the quickest thing we had to do. But we have scheduled... Uh, what we project to be some, you know, top teams in Power Five conferences. Um, like we have an LSU on looking on uh, the first weekend. Uh, we're going to go out to Hawaii probably for the third weekend and play a very good Hawaii team, we think, a Pepperdine team. Uh, and then hopefully round that out with a few more like top RPI teams. So we want to we be challenged. I mean, our philosophy is we got... We feel like we have a team that has some leadership, some years behind it. We want to see them challenged, but also we got to we got to rack up some wins, knowing we're going to go through a pretty tough Pac-12 uh, schedule. Well, knowing that uh, you have to play where the recruits are, I'm going to throw this to Kathy because she's got some really good recruiting questions for you, and that's the other big thing to go with these two. Go for it, Kathy. All right. Well, first of all, Jen and Amir, I love them. Good people. So that's uh, definitely, you know, two great hires uh, that I'm aware of. So say hi for me. Um, the, you know, you've gone through recruiting and you've probably, you come with a roster. Um, what have been some of the additions and subtractions to the roster that you had last year? I know you brought in some transfers. Uh, can you tell us about all of that? Yeah. So uh, when I took the job, we, I think the biggest, uh, loss we probably took was Charity Looper from last year, a great six rotation player for the team. And, uh, you know, she found a nice spot in Louisville. And I think, uh, you know, it was just a, she was ready to move on to something different. And as we know, with coaching changes, sometimes that happens. Um, so we're, we were happy that she found a good place where she want, she wants to be. Um, we were able to retain Anna Dodson, uh, yeah. who was in the transfer portal. Um, but, you know, 
was we were, felt very fortunate that we were able to reach her and and share our vision with her and she decided to stay so uh, awesome. she was a big keep for us and probably the first big win for our staff to keep her as a Bruin. Uh, we then brought in uh, Carly Hendrickson Carly, out of yeah. University of Florida and uh, with Charity leaving we know we needed another pin and you know I've, I saw Carly when I was recruiting her at Illinois and saw her right. a lot through her junior process and so it's nice to kind of rekindle that and and get her to uh, see our vision and she was the next person we brought on and then we dabbled into the transfer portal very quickly and uh, we knew we needed another middle so we took uh, Desiree Becker from Northwestern and she'll be a fifth year grad student uh, you know she has played for Amir she played for Amir at yeah. Northwestern so it's very familiar with a really good blocker style. and a great really blocker yeah. yes um, you yeah. know really fast Kathy you know her well like yeah. just really dynamic and um so she's rounding us out nicely there. We're still looking for probably one more piece out of the transfer portal this spring to bring in. Um, and then we have a really great 23 class who we just saw this weekend at uh, Triple Crown that two of our kids out of that 23 class were in the open finals of 18s and right. competing. So, so you were feeling good about where you're at. Feeling pretty good. Yeah. Um, I think with the pieces we have coming in, I think our roster is going to be, we're going to have some good depth. Uh, we'll have some good experience coupled with a lot of young talent coming in. Do you have a lot of graduating seniors for next year or do you have to start looking at that or are you uh, pretty young? We actually retain, um, we only lose one senior uh, from next year. And there's one potential, one player who's a pivotal piece, our opposite, Amon mm -hmm. uh, Njai, who's, uh, yeah. we're, we'll see what she decides to do with her COVID year. She has another COVID right. year and so right. we're, figuring out what she's going to do with that. But hopefully she, uh, you know, she decides to stay because I think she can be pretty good. Right, right. Well, well, absolutely. And I mean, she's another, yeah, she's a, she's a big player too. So it looks to me like you're in pretty good shape. So um, I'm going to, I'm going to throw this thing over to uh, Babo here who has some questions about NIL, which is a whole nother thing for you to get involved oh, in. Oh gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Babo, we have to remember that bill. Babo. Babo. Yeah. We got to, we're going to have to jump here. into this uh, NLI. Uh, yeah. It's an area that we've been kind of jumping into a, a, quite a bit in the last few weeks mm -hmm. with some of the coaches, but we also had, you know, uh, an expert on uh, last week, you know, talking about NLI and, and possibly we'll have one on next week, uh, you know, talking about NLI. But it's relatively new for all coaches. Uh, what, do you, what does UCLA NLI, NLI uh, NIL involvement yeah. look like? Yeah, it's uh, so new for me, Bob, you know, coming in like when I was at Illinois, it didn't exist and San Diego, it, we're still navigating it. But UCLA is pretty far ahead of it, actually, in regards to, um, I think, some of the infrastructure they have in place and uh, being in Los Angeles. I mean, the market for, uh, I think, a lot of companies to support athletes is pretty large here. So uh, one thing that's interesting here and I learned very quickly is we actually have um a program that our athletes, it's called the Westwood Exchange, and it's its basically 145 companies that have subscribed to, hey, we're here to support athletes, and um, really, it's just the athlete, it's up to the athlete to go in and solicit themselves and whatever their interests are, and so they have access to uh, sitting companies that are are interested in, in funding them and backing their, their brand, so that's been really new to me um and a different another like area that we're trying to push and promote for our athletes and not necessarily from a monetary basis but i think nil has the ability to connect athletes for post you know collegiate interests and whatever endeavors our athletes may want to uh, seek out when they're done playing if they're done playing after their collegiate um, eligibility so we see it as a way to hey let's see if we can get athletes connected uh, in the professional realm a little sooner. Um, and certainly there's obviously advantages with some monetary um, kickback if, if they should find that. So uh, there's a lot of things in place. We're still, I'm still navigating it with our program and seeing um, what resonates the best with our athletes, but uh, it's definitely on the move here and uh, probably further along than I think uh, at any other, at least, at least other university that I've been at, so. So Alfie, there's, NIL collective that I think you just described mm -hmm. 145 companies is that just for UCLA 
Yeah, mm -hmm. I think that, so the Westwood Exchange is specific to UCLA, but I also know there's um, something of that, and I can't remember the name, it's going to drive me nuts, Bob. There's something on a national level that um, athletes, I think, have access to. Um, I probably need to do a little more homework. I don't want to speak off the cusp and, and put anything out there that's not, but I know it exists. Uh, and I guess that goes to show how much more I have to learn about NIL because it's all pretty new to me. <laughs> well, it's it's new to it's new to everybody, and but that's why yeah. we're discussing it with everyone. Yeah, to try to get information out there. I mean, the fact that this Westwood, you know, exchange is, you know, this collective is 145, you know, different companies. That's pretty good. So yeah. my last question was about: uh, Is this a positive impact? Uh, and and obviously, it's a positive for UCLA. Do you think NIL is positive generically for all universities? You know, I think it really comes down like beauty is in the eye of the beholder, however we leverage it, you know, and so we can use anything to positive uh, in a positive lens or or not. And so we're trying to utilize it in something that's meaningful for our athletes, not just uh, transactional, but how can we get something uh, in these in these relationships with companies or whatever professional endeavors our athletes are interested in, interested in, how can we give them uh, the platform to be more successful or a step ahead when they do leave uh, being collegiate athletes, which a lot of them probably are not going to pursue volleyball after. And so we just want to set them up better for when they leave UCLA and get into the real world. All right. Now, before the show started, as we usually do, we're chit-chatting away and you were you were talking about the tournament this past weekend, Triple Crown, and how you were uh, amazed at how many of your friends were wearing different different jerseys. I think Bill has a couple of questions, you know, wanting to talk to you about uh, your move. So, Bill? Hey, Alfie. Bill Walton here. Hi, Bill. Hey, uh, this, is, uh, this is kind of karma. You're a UCLA follower mm -hmm. when you were young. And coming out of high school, my grandmother sends me a Chicago Sun-Times article that was about this big saying, Bill Walton, the best basketball player in the country, is going to UCLA. <laughs> so for a few years, my grandmother thought I was the starting center at UCLA. So not to be confused with the real Bill Walton, I'm here to ask Alfie some questions about volleyball. <laughs> Great. That is a great story, Bill. I'm not going to lie. I, I thought about it when I saw your name. I was like, huh, interesting. <laughs> well, and and your he and I, dead shirt. For, that's yeah. right. And he and I played basketball at the same time in college. And uh, the jokes coming from referees and players <laughs> sure in the they gave stands you a hard time. <laughs> were, yes, constantly a hard time. I met him at the 96 Olympics. I was doing television and he was doing NBC and we had a chance to finally meet face to face. He's a, I'm a William G and he's a William T. So <laughs> I, I'm, I'm by name a UCLA product. So here I there am. Are. <laughs> <laughs> so here you are, you're, you're in my favorite city, San Diego, where I always wanted to retire, live in La Jolla, right across the beach. And you leave for crowded LA. <laughs> going on. I know, what was I thinking, right? Gosh, I must be off my crocker a little bit. What were you thinking? <laughs> Why? Tell me, tell me how this is not an easy thought process. People just think it's easy to jump to becoming a head coach. You know, it's fun being an assistant coach. The pressure is way less. I mean, you can you can give the head coach any idea you want. And if it doesn't work, it's not your fault. It's the damn head coach's fault. So <laughs> tell me, why do you go to UCLA to be the head coach from San Diego, the most beautiful city in the US outside of Honolulu and Hawaii? Gosh, Bill, you're you're making me really second guess my decision here. <laughs> <laughs> Well, maybe you should have called me before you took Yeah, I know. I know. Um, you know, I think at the tail end of my time at San Diego, uh, we had a great season and I got to work with one of the best in, in the industry. Jen Petri is phenomenal. She's great. She does. Yeah. Um, and I really, to be really frank and honest with you all, I didn't, you know, entering the last season, I, I didn't have my eyes set on head coaching. I mean, I was very, I felt very comfortable in the role I was in. I love being in the gym, but um I think there was a natural evolution that happened through the year and, and just working with that team and the space that uh, Coach Petri allowed me to operate in um, really grew me in a lot of ways to, I think, so solidify some philosophies and, and things that 
had always been marinating, but we got to really put in, um, put some traction under and, and some ground under. And so I say that because by the end of the year, I think I knew, um, I knew that I was ready to take that step. And it was the first time in my career where I felt really sure about if, if an opportunity presented itself that I felt aligned with where I want to be in my life in terms of the university space, um, my, my, my personal life, um, and then, of course, have the potential of a university and a program to really excel, then I would take the leap. And um, when UCLA came across, there was no question in my mind that this was this was, you know, meant to, it's, it was the step I was ready and needed to take. Um, I prize myself on challenging myself quite a bit and, and staying curious for learning new things. And it was just time to, to see what else, um, how else I could push the envelope uh, in this respective space of the volleyball community. And uh, it just felt like, you know, it all kind of aligned up and it was, it was a good time to, to see if I can move one seat over and uh, what I could do with it. So. Alpha, you uh, mentioned earlier you wanted uh, to say hello to Aaron, so we're going to try to bring him in here so you can at least say hello. And Great. <laughs> hey, Aaron. Alpha. Yes. I'm so happy we crossed. Oh, look, Aaron has a whiteboard. Look at that whiteboard. That's nice. Yeah, That's we're awesome. going to zoom in on that. Yeah, we'll, we'll yeah there you go. Out. See, Wait, I was in. telling you, Alpha, this, is, this is what it is. Now we get to spy. It's our, nice. our preseason schedule, and it's nothing exciting. <laughs> Even better. Aaron, we'll, we'll have to ask you about that. I wanted to say hi, Aaron. I know you got your time, but good to see you, buddy. Good to see you, man. It's fun to see you this weekend. We'll see you on the road again. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thanks, well, thanks Alfie. Okay. Bye, Alfie, awesome. Thanks a lot. Good luck. Say hi for me. I will. Thanks, awesome. Bruins. I will. Have a great yeah, day. Really Bye, excited. Everybody. I want to see that match with Brad. Uh, actually, both matches with Brad this coming year. That should we be it. We got you, Nick, but we get we'll get you the pass list, not Brad. Don't worry. Come to okay. Brad. All right. <laughs> Good. I'll get it. I could get there for, through you. That would be great. All right. You have a great uh, great week and uh, get those guys ready for this fall. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. it was fun. Good luck. Bye -bye. All right. See, see you. So, Bob, we have a, another coach, right? Yeah, we sure do. <laughs> Brand new coach. But the really interesting thing is we have two Liberos. Yeah, both of these guys. Who is better? Liberos Who's in better? college. Alfie, it's for sure Alfie. <laughs> yeah. Al even close. Alfie so was I, better? Oh. Well, I don't, I don't know if he told you this, but we were at Santa Barbara together. At the well, same I was just going to ask you that. Were you at Santa Barbara together? Because yeah. I see he went to Hawaii from Santa Barbara and you stayed. Yeah. I was a year older, so he came in my redshirt freshman year, and he was a freshman, and uh, we had a really close battle, and um, he transferred to Hawaii and had a great career, and obviously a great career with the national team, but I think maybe I was better than him for maybe one year, when that redshirt year at Santa Barbara. <laughs> he, he had an incredible career. Alfie was an absolute stud of a player. And I'm sure you guys realize that just from talking with him, you know, for the last 20 or 30 minutes, he's just a, a really incredible human. And um, yeah, he, he got real good at Hawaii and, and after they're on the national team. So I would definitely, it's actually not even close. He, he was way better than I was. <laughs> well, let me, let me introduce you. Aaron Mansfield is who we're talking to. He's the new head coach at the university of Oklahoma, but he comes all the way from the West Coast, and he has a background that uh, is really quite interesting. Plus, his brother and he both are getting off the coast and coming to the Midwest. Uh, brother Jason is at Kansas State now, and I've been to Manhattan, so you got the better deal, <laughs> let me tell you right now. I haven't been in Manhattan, but with being in Norman, it definitely definitely feels like I got I got a good deal here. You, you're going to drive along the highway and you're going to feel you're going to see a hole in the ground and you're going to drive down into this hole and Manhattan sits down there. It's like a <laughs> crater hit the earth and punched this place out. And it's it's intriguing. It has lights. It's like you're just going on this rocky highway uh, out in the middle of nowhere in Kansas. And all at once, boom, there's Manhattan right down in the, <laughs> the middle of this crater. So I, yeah. I actually kind of enjoyed it. But Jason, uh, you you spent six years as the LMU coach and, and you and Tom Black pretty much put LMU on the, on the uh, schedule for everybody in the country, because you guys built that program into a powerhouse and you were challenging San Diego this year and BYU and Pepperdine 
uh, we couldn't tell who where you were in the top four. We didn't think you were one, but we thought you could beat one on any given night. So you really had it going. And besides that, you spent five years at Santa Clara. Uh, and prior to Santa Clara, uh, you were an assistant with the men's team at Santa Barbara. Uh, there's some other things that you did in the beach and with the national team and with coaching clubs and that sort of thing. But you, you're you not a, an unseasoned coach. The only thing that's got to be giving you uh, fits is, one, how do I hire a staff here in Oklahoma? And if you've done that, tell us about it and tell us what your philosophy was to do that. And then also tell us what you're going to do with the third assistant now that it looks like the NC2A is going to approve in, in July. Uh, and is Oklahoma going to get involved in that also? Yeah, good question. So staffing, uh, you know, after I got the job, the, the first thing I wanted to do was, was Zoom with all the current players here at OU and, and really start to get to know them. And, um, and then my, my head started spinning and I, about a staff here, but I'd, I'd been thinking about that. Uh, kind of leading up to accepting the job. And um, Brian Thornton, who was my assistant at LMU for the last two seasons, um, is here with me at University of Oklahoma. And him and I trained together on the national team in 2010. So we lived together in Anaheim and just kind of became immediate friends. And um, he was one of the two setters in the 2012 Olympics. Um, he was the assistant coach with John Sprawl on the U.S. men's national team from 2016 to 2021. And he really redesigned USA men's offense for those four years that uh, he was a coach. And so when I played with him, uh, he, I always thought to myself, if he, was, if he was to get into coaching when he was done playing and find ways to impart the knowledge that he had to his players, he would be an incredible coach. And that's just what he's done. He's... Um, He's got a very different volleyball mind. He looks at the game differently. And what we've done is we've applied a lot of the tactical concepts from high level international men's volleyball into our gym. And we started doing that at LMU the last two years. And so we work very well together. We know each other really well. And so it was really important for me to bring someone here that I, that I knew and that I trusted and that um, had the same vision as I did of how we want to build this thing here. Um, both culturally and from a volleyball standpoint. So getting him on board was my first priority. And um, after we had a, the season that we did at LMU of making the tournament, he was getting courted by a lot of other schools because he's very well respected in the volleyball community. Um, and I think he really has enjoyed working with me and working together. And so big reason for him coming here was, I, I think the trust that he has in me and the relationship that we've built um, together and working on the same staff. He committed to coming to Oklahoma without ever even seeing it before. The first time he came out here was on a caravan ride. Myself, Brian, and my other assistant, Meredith, drove out from LA to Norman, Oklahoma on a two day road trip. And we all followed each other. We packed our cars and uh, Meredith and Brian hadn't seen it and uh, they've been here ever since. And so um, getting him on board was, was uh, item number one as far as staffing. And then Meredith Teague uh, played for me for four years at LMU. She was my first recruit actually. And she was on our staff for the last two years as kind of like a volunteer uh, director of ops. She ran camps and clinics. She's kind of like a Swiss army knife. She's done everything. <laughs> she, does our, she does our data volley. Um, and so we created a technical coordinator role for her here. Um, and she's actually going to hopefully morph into that third assistant position um, as a technical coordinator slash recruiting assistant. Because as we all know, recruiting is such a big, big animal and she really enjoys it. She's passionate about it. She's extremely good at it. And so we're hoping to fill that role, uh, that new role with her is kind of like a dual role. And then we have an opening right now for our other assistant that we're in the, the hiring process of right now. Hopefully we'll find the right person here within the next couple of weeks. We've had a couple of candidates on campus. And, uh, and then our director of ops has been here for seven years. He's decided to stay. Uh, his name's Drake. He's done an incredible job. Um, having someone here that has had knowledge of the university and, and competing and traveling in the Big 12 is uh, has been really nice to have. And so um, when recruits have come on campus, we don't know where anything is really. So he's led all the tours and we feel like everything's still really new for us. But that's kind of the makeup of our staff right now. And uh, we feel like we're in a really good spot. The next large gorilla in the room, as Bill Walton puts it, is scheduling for you guys. You come yeah. in uh, 
were you pre-scheduled or can you schedule your pre-conference matches the way you want to and lastly are you including SEC teams because you're only going to be in the big 12 for a year then you're going to have to go in and, and face all those SEC people these are all mid part of the country and southeastern part of the country teams so uh, a lot of different places to go and people to see what what do you got on the board there that we can uh, yeah. share with you? <laughs> good question um we were only uh contractually bound to one weekend and that was the second weekend we're going to oregon state to play uh at oregon state and and boise state um for a return trip uh, since there wasn't anything on the schedule for preseason when I took the job, uh, there was a limited amount of uh, preseason tournaments that were, were open. And, you know, the Big 12 schedule this year is tough. Uh, you know, RPI-wise, going into the NCAA tournament, they were the highest ranked RPI conference. And so we knew going in that we were going to be playing a lot of good teams in our conference a lot of highly ranked RPI teams and, and just really tough competition. So we wanted to try to find a balance with our with our preseason schedule of um, matches we feel like if we play well that we can win, um, ones where uh, teams are going to be pretty even with us, and then we want to stretch ourselves a little bit to um, prepare ourselves for a really tough conference schedule. So we open up at Ball State against uh, Ball State and Gonzaga and IPFW, and then we go to Oregon State to play Oregon State and Boise, third weekend, we go to Notre Dame to play Notre Dame in Illinois. So that'll be a really tough weekend. And then our fourth weekend, um, we're hosting Texas State. We might try to do a home and away with them, but that's another team that's a 20 plus win team each season and uh, is always tough. And so we feel like it's a good balance of, um, you know, kind of what I mentioned about uh, challenging ourselves just enough and, and, have, and feeling stretched a little bit, um, but also having some matches where we feel like if we play well, we can win. So. I, I like how it's rounded out. Again, we didn't have a ton of options. Um, a lot of people had were kind of done with their preseason schedule and their tournaments um, were already full. But with what was out there, we feel like uh, this this could be a good schedule for us. And we still have some uncertainty about our current roster, but you know we'll see how it goes. So Kathy George, the former head coach at Michigan State, uh, recruited the Indiana area quite a bit. And I see you're going to Indiana twice. So, Kathy, what do you could tell him about recruiting in Indiana? Yes, please. I'll tell you what. I mean, there's some good volleyball there, so you can uh, definitely, definitely pick some up while you're there. But your your that schedule sounds pretty good, and Ball State's a good team. Is uh, I think Kelly's done a great job out there. So you know you got to get they're that. All, done. They're all juniors this year too. Yeah, so watch they're, out. They're yeah. talented. You yeah, know, they look real good on coach. film. That's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. But um, going back to your roster, I know I noticed that it looked like you had on the roster page about eight players there. So my question to you is, how how are you looking to build that? And is that through the transfer portal? Is that, you know, do you have a lot of freshmen coming in? What does it look like for the future? Yeah, we have uh, we have nine current players on our roster. Um, we added a, a transfer from Texas State, Daly Ellison, who joined us in January, who's been a great addition to the team. Um we have three incoming freshmen, and uh, and and we've gotten two commits so far um, in the portal, and so we, we've rounded out to about to fourteen, and mm -hmm. uh, we're looking to add probably two or three more, um, and so we've we've had some uh, transfers on campus, and and I. Uh, I think building a team around the transfer portal is obviously it's dicey and, and you mm -hmm. never know what you're going to get there. Um, I think having a balanced roster is really important just from a health standpoint and a competition standpoint. And there's still one or two positions where we feel just a little thin in. And um, obviously the best option of how you get good as quick as possible is you try to add a transfer that has that skill set that meets the needs of your roster as well as can meet the needs of your culture. And as we all know, that's, that's a challenging thing to find. Uh, those Excellent. two combinations um, with the with the two additions that we have, uh, you know, not including the three incoming freshmen, uh, we were able to find that we got a, a transfer middle from Liberty, who was their best player and in, in, in leading point scorer uh, in the middle, and and she's going to be a really nice asset for us. Um, and then we just uh, got a commitment from Ireland McNeese, who plays for Club D and was actually committed to us at LMU. And uh, that commitment kind of fell through. And so we're adding her and she's just another great person. She's a, kind of a jack of all trades volleyball player. And um, so we feel like we're close. I think if we can add two or three more, 
um, we're going to have a very well-rounded roster. And so you've, you've been practicing a fair amount already. So you have yeah. an idea of what you're looking for. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, so again, are these transfers coming in? Are they a little bit older, younger, or are you? Yeah. So the transfer from Liberty um, has two years left. Mm -hmm. uh, we're bringing a couple other transfers on campus here in the next couple of weeks who uh, vary from grad transfers to having three years left. And so, um, you know, as, as we all know, re building recruiting classes going forward with knowing that there's transfers on the portal every single year, I think everybody has a little bit different of a philosophy, but uh, I think a consistent one is everyone's trying to leave at least one scholarship open, right. you know, for the transfer portal. And um, I inherited a, 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 a particular situation here where we have we have some openings that we need to fill. And mm -hmm. so we're probably going to be utilizing the portal this year, maybe more so than we would in, in the coming years based on a necessity. Um, but that's just kind of where we're at right now. Have you thought about um, also with the change in conference, has that opened up doors differently into the SEC territory more? Uh, you may not know that yet. I don't, that's a good question. I don't know that yet. Um, you know, just uh, with being so new and, and getting used mm -hmm. to just the region in general. I mean, obviously right. Texas just has an incredible amount of, of talent. And so the first order of business this week yeah. is to get down yeah. there at the gyms. And so our assistant coach, Meredith, who I talked about before, is she's mm -hmm. going to be in, in the gyms all this week in Houston and, and Dallas. And, um, you know, we really feel like that footprint is extremely important for us. And then once we get a little bit, hopefully more established regionally, we can start branching out into some areas that maybe been a little bit more neglected in the past. And, and so my hope to your question, my hope is once we're in the conference a little bit and we can uh, get used to it and just get a little bit more, I think branding recognition in those areas, hopefully that will help recruiting. Well, branding is a good big word right now. So yeah, absolutely, <laughs> it's a totally big word and it's uh, really taken off. And so much so that uh, Bob's going to talk to you about M NIL. I believe that Bob had a couple of questions on that because that's a whole new animal. That's all branding. Yeah, a big, branding. yeah, it sounds like you're getting started there. So <laughs> Bob, go hey, ahead. Hey, Bob, before he jumps, it'd be nice to know if you've gone head to head with Jason for any recruits. Ah. Uh, not, you know, not yet. A lot of the... A lot of the recruits that we both have were committed to the universities, uh, each of our each of our schools before we got the job. So, I'm pretty sure it's probably going to happen at some point, uh, especially especially in this 2025 class. Oh, and, I'd like to see that. Yeah, no, it's going to be <laughs> it's going to be fun. I can't can't wait for it. <laughs> well, looking at the uh, NIL, Aaron, uh, and we're talking about recruiting, uh, you know, in, in in Oklahoma, how's the NIL involvement? look at, at Oklahoma and does it uh, affect your recruiting at all? It hasn't yet. And honestly, I, I, I still think it's in, in its infancy to, in a certain respect, maybe not for sports like, you know, football and basketball. I think that there was uh, those sports in, in a particular schools and conferences were very well prepared yeah. uh, for when the rule did go through that they were ready to kind of rock and roll with it. I think volleyball, I, I'll speak for OU because I know some other schools, it's different. Uh, there is a collective here. Um, my athletic director has been very transparent about trying to find some creative ways in order for our, our student athletes to have access to it. Um, that's about all I know right now because um, there hasn't really been um, a whole lot talked about so far or a whole lot done. But the hope is that it becomes a, a part of our recruiting um, as it, as it, is that you know schools like Texas and, and other schools who I think have uh, had some things in place that they were ready to go when, when like I said when the rule got changed so it's still really new for us and and, and quite honestly um, it doesn't seem like it's on the minds of our of of our players right now too much mm -hmm. um, I think it's going to be a bigger part of the recruiting process going forward because like I said the schools that have it in place are going to use it as a a recruiting tool which. That's and probably transfers too. Transfers too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's just kind of the landscape of college athletics right now. So um, there's still some things to be figured out here when it comes to it. And so it's uh, it's kind of hard to, to know where that lies right now. So, so it sounds like uh, maybe you're a little bit behind some of the other schools in, in, the, in the Big 12. All right. We're not possibly in the SEC, but you're, you're moving. In, in the right direction, but what do you feel like, generally speaking, is NIL uh, 
a, a positive thing and how's it impacting volleyball in general? Oh man, is there a right answer to this? I feel like this is a trap of some sort. <laughs> it's a trap. <laughs> no, um, Be careful, tread lightly. But yeah, listen, like just with like with anything else, I'm I'm very middle of the road with a lot of these things. I think that there's, I understand the side of obviously the name, image, likeness, and and uh, institutions and corporations and and big time money people who are making money off these student athletes without the student athletes having any. Uh, either any say or any financial gain from it. I, I definitely understand that. I think the challenging part as a coach is some of the motivations of the student athletes have just now shifted um, where they care more about things that are more individualistic, like their branding, their social media. And then it becomes a little bit more about that versus the team and the, and the collective. And so um I think that concept, I, I, I haven't been doing this for a long time, but that concept is still very foreign to me and it's challenging to uh, coach with sometimes. Uh, fortunately, or unfortunately, but fortunately in my mind, uh, the NIL situation has not really been very prevalent at, at LMU. It wasn't really a thing. None of our players really seeked it out. It wasn't an issue for them or not an issue. It wasn't a priority uh, or a motivation for them. And it's been like that at OU too, but I can see where this is going and, mm -hmm. and how it's going to shift and, and I need to be ready for it. But I think with anything else, there's a benefit to it. And I think that there's a cost. And I think the benefit is for sure for the student athletes, financial uh, abilities. I think the cost is uh, navigating, trying to get a group of individuals to buy into a, to a, a collective group. Good uh, is going to just become more challenging. Well, you talked a little bit about your, your trip to Oklahoma, and I know Bill has some questions he wants to ask about uh, that move. So I'm going to let, let Bill ask those. Hello, Aaron. Hi, how are you? I, my first question is this. Who's the better coach, you or your brother? My brother. <laughs> my brother, for sure. Yep. You're so is humble. It? I love it. <laughs> who's oh, who's listen, older? Let's just, oh, my brother by six years. So my, my brother's been – my brother was my coach growing up. He has had incredible experiences with John Dunning at Stanford. He worked for Kevin Hambly, Chris Thomas, Keegan Cook. I mean, he's, he's worked for, I think, some of the greats and, and you know, none more than John Dunning. I, I, I have a high affinity for him. And um, my brother just has tremendous experience. And I just, I felt like he kept getting overlooked, honestly, for a lot of head coaching jobs. And um, I'm just so happy for him uh being at Kansas State and obviously he's close to me and um but he's he's got the experience on me he's coached club for 20 years you know he's done it he's done it way more than I have I was playing a lot of volleyball while he was coaching a lot of volleyball so I think he's got a lot more figured out than I do which brings me to the next part of my question here you are Barbara beaches Santa Clara gorgeous beaches <laughs> LMU you're all Walking distance to Manhattan Beach almost. I know where this and is. And now, <laughs> Thunderbird Lake Reservoir. What the hell are you doing? It's so funny you say that. And so the, I think it was the second or third day we were here with my assistants. We had just drove in and we looked on a map and said, we got to go find a body of water and see what this is about. And we drove to Thunderbird Lake. And I think we spent maybe 10 minutes looking at it. And we got right back in the car and drove back to our house. It is, you know, it's different out here for sure. Um, <laughs> No, you know, <laughs> why, why, you know, why the move? I, I think, uh, I think there's a lot of different reasons for sure. Um, I loved LMU. Uh, I developed some really close relationships with my players and their parents just through the recruiting process. I mean, we made the tournament last year starting six sophomores. I, I had in my mind that we were going to be competitive for a couple of years. And I really liked my athletic director and uh, RSWA and, I felt like we had some good things going, some good momentum, and um, kind of out of nowhere, this opportunity came up, and I took the interview. I'd never been to Oklahoma before. I just took the interview just to uh, see what it was about and talk to the athletic director and see what his vision was, and it was a very kind of genuine, authentic conversation. I didn't even know it was a job that I wanted, so I was just very much myself, and hey, here's who I am, and here's what I'm about, and um, I think I got really lucky and um, was able to fly out here with my wife two days later and saw the university and just the town for the first time and met with a real estate agent and did that whole thing. And 
they offered me the job the next day and I accepted it the day after. So everything happened within about a five day span. And my wife is from Southern California. So all those places that you mentioned about how beautiful they are. Um, we had some, uh, what I would call relationship building conversations there in about a 24 hour span about moving out here. But, um, you know, they, they were able to join me last week. We have two young boys, four and seven, and they've gotten acclimated into some schools here and we're, we're absolutely loving it. I mean, it is very, very different for all some of the things that you mentioned, but we were looking for something a little bit slower paced. Um, to be honest, we were a single income family in Los Angeles and that is just, it's really hard. And so it's really more of a family decision. And um, I really like taking on these type of challenges of, of rebuilding. Um, it's something that I'm very passionate about. And not to say we had to do that at LMU, because I know, Mick, you mentioned all the success that Tom Black had, and that's absolutely true. And I, I felt very fortunate to be inheriting a group that valued things like learning and worked really hard. I think we have, we have different approaches a little bit, so it took a little while for the players to get used to, but um, just feel really fortunate that I was able to be at LMU for those years. And, but there was a rebuilding sense to it because we had so many people leave. And um, I really enjoyed that process. It's really hard, but that's kind of the same feeling that I have here at OU. I feel like there's something special that we could build here. Well, John Cook made a switch from San Diego to Nebraska. You yeah. can make the switch from He seems LA. to be doing okay, you know. He He's seems to be right. okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, and – Started in the Big Eight, which is now the Big Twelve, and now he's in the Big Ten, and you're going to the SEC. So, yep, yep. I think it. I think it's natural that you have the same success that Nebraska has. So there you go. I so hope it we'll works. We'll give you like two that. years. We'll give you two years. <laughs> Thank two you. Two years. <laughs> I might need a couple more. <laughs> These guys with the tough, portal, aren't they? Not with the portal. <laughs> I know that's thing, true. One thing that uh, kind of stood out to me too is like you're coming from LMU. By the way, my dad played basketball there. Oh, cool. Uh, for a little bit. Yep. Yeah. And um, and then uh, but it's a you know it's so much smaller. And now you see when you get to Oklahoma, I mean they have a lot of resources and they you know their athletic department is is a big Power Five conference. I mean, was that do you find things different? Like you have people to do a lot more for you all around, and it's like figuring out how to manage them and everything else. That's such a good question because I'm I'm living that right now. I so at LMU is myself and my two assistants, and we did the marketing, the branding, the social media, the recruiting, the camps, the fundraising. It was a one stop shop. And coming from coaching men's volleyball, you know that's that's just what you do. So I I didn't know any different. I've never had a full time paid director of volleyball. I've never had a grad assistant. Um, I have more help here than I even know what to do with. And so delegating is, is, a, is a big area of growth for me because I'm just not used to it. And um, so I think that's part of it. And then the amount of resources, the, it is different. And when I walked around for my, um, for my interview, you, you saw the resources and the bright, shiny objects and, and all those things. And that's really nice. Um, but what really stuck out to me was the people behind the resources and how passionate they were. I mean, we have five full-time licensed psychologists just to work with our student athletes. And mm -hmm. that, that is the, the mental health space is so important. Um, and there's been way more financial investment into that for the student athletes. And to be honest, I, I felt like at Santa Clara and at, at LMU, I had to wear that hat and I'm not a, I'm not a professional and I probably gave some pretty bad advice at times because I only know what I know and I just want to help. But, um, you know, just to have certain things like that, it's really those things that stuck out to me versus, yeah, we have nice whirlpools here and we have the stuff and, right, and all that's right. great. But I just think that from like a, a really a holistic standpoint, th those are the things that really stuck out to me um, of just having the, just an immense amount of support for the, for the student athletes is uh, it's different. Mm -hmm. Well, Aaron, thank you very much for, for agreeing to be on the show. We really appreciate the time you spent with us, and we wish you the best of luck. Thanks. Forward. Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Learn about that Texas OU football game. I just Cross learned about it, and I need to go. <laughs> Cross the Red River, baby. Cross that, the Red River. That's the, that's the real deal. You have to do that. Absolutely. I want to go. Half out. red and half orange. That's Just crazy. ugly. It's crazy. I got to get there. <laughs> All right, Aaron. Thanks. All right. See you guys. See you All back. right, Aaron. Bye-bye. All right. We'll transition into our buzz reaction. Uh, Bill, thoughts on our two coaches today? Yep. Oh.
Oh, I'm. Here we go. Um, I think that uh, two very bright young men. Um, they've uh, done their apprenticeship. They're ready for the next thing. I think that uh, both schools should be happy with their hires and moving forward. Um, I think Aaron's and uh, Elfie's challenges are both huge. Um, UCLA was a perennial Final Four team and in the NCAA every year, and they've fallen off a little bit. And I think the expectation is, is they need to get back there. And, and then they're also going into the Big Ten. In Oklahoma, they want to beat Texas. Um, Barry, he needs to call Barry Switzer. Barry knows how to get those kids out of Texas. So um, the uh, I think these guys are uh, in for some good challenges, and I think they're both up to it, and I think uh, we're going to see some good things from both of them moving forward. Gabby? I agree. I, I really uh, enjoyed meeting with both of them, and uh, I think that they're well-equipped for the jobs. I think they're big. I think the big jobs, you know, you've got UCLA and – um, Martin Jarman's the AD there. He's a great guy. He does love volleyball. I think that's really important at UCLA. And and uh, but now you're joining a Big Ten and you have to go across country. So there's different challenges and those types of things. But um, because he's had uh, experience in the Big Ten, I think that's going to make that a lot a lot easier. And uh, with Aaron, Oklahoma, the roster was small, but it looks like he's getting that under control and has to build that roster a little bit up. And and they're going to be in for some some strong competition in the SEC. But he's he uh, really did uh, have a nice plan for that. And and um, looking forward to watching him. Well, I'm watching Mick right now. He's he's reading as as the show's going on. Go? And I can <laughs> I can just see the steam. Stop the <laughs> he's, at, he's got something he wants to say here. Of course he does. A Texas guy. He's been in the Pac-12 and <laughs> he's got this yeah. all down. Well, I, I had I had a couple of observations. I like both of these guys. I think they're really good coaches. Um, <clears throat> what they're stuck with is what Bill was referring to. First of all, Alfie's got to convince the blue bloods at uh ucla that that he's a ucla guy and that's going to be a hard sell because that's a tight click and uh they've they've put out a number of guys and they still support each other as, as if it's a, a fraternity that won't go away so there's not one ucla graduate on that staff and so that's that's a hard sell for alfie and uh i don't think that he can't do it but I think that he's going to going to struggle a little bit until he can get a warm welcome into that group because he needs that group to be UCLA again like the UCLA we knew when we were playing them uh the last uh the last 10 years has just not been what Andy Banikowski started and and developed and uh as much as we like to to beat on Andy, if you look at the track record, he just was a, a great, great Bruin playing and coaching. You take, and and the NIL perspective, uh, UCLA's got a big, big opportunity there for Alfie because they already have their collective started. Uh, I got the impression that uh, Oklahoma's, have you been to Norman? If you haven't been to Norman, I can tell you about Norman too, because I interviewed there in the uh, late seventies and um, I've been to Norman several times. Uh, the Alfords were there. Uh, Mike, Mike uh, who was the athletic director at Florida state and his wife who played at, uh, at Hawaii lived there. Florida and, state, yeah. yeah. They, they loved it there at Norman, but I sense that he's got a rude awakening coming. First of all, this Big 12 travel, uh, and this is intense. These guys play hard in the Big 12. Uh, you don't, they don't get recognized very well. Then you add Todd Dagenet's team from Central Florida, the Houston team, who I think that coach is an outstanding coach, uh, and BYU on top of that this year. Uh, all these teams are coming, I believe, this year. I mean, this is going to be a slugfest. And then he has to play his brother twice. Uh, you know that, and you only time you have good feelings is at the Christmas and Thanksgiving dinners, and they're not having Thanksgiving together because they, unless they're playing each other on that weekend. So, uh, I'm I'm thinking that uh, this is going to take a while. I ho I hope the athletic directors are patient. 
And he was right about one thing. Oklahoma has to recruit Texas, specifically the Dallas area. Uh, they can get kids from Houston, but the Dallas area knows OU. It's about three hours, right? Yeah, the Texas OU game there in Dallas mm -hmm. is half Oklahoma, half Tex half Texas, and there there are big Oklahoma supporters there. So he has to get into North Texas to recruit. I, I don't know why he's playing in uh, in Indiana, uh, but if he gets Indiana kids. They'll be good, but that won't relate to what he's trying to build. OU is all about beating Texas. And when both of those guys go into the SEC the next year, then they got Craig Skinner and Mary Wise and Tom Black. And I mean, this is just, uh, yeah, they, they have to grow up quick, uh, I, I think. Yeah, especially because all those especially because all those SEC programs are already in Texas recruiting the hell out of Texas. That's I right. mean, every, every year, one of yes. the top players goes to LSU and one of the top yes. players goes to Kentucky and one of the top players goes to Florida and Texas gets three of them and OU is not getting any of them. And unless you start getting some of the top kids out of Texas yeah. and it's keeping the be very best two kids out of Oklahoma every year, yeah. you're, it's going to be a struggle. I agree. Yeah, that's exactly right. And that, that I'm telling you, just knowing this, uh, I, when I came to Texas, I showed, I went down to San Antonio for the high school all-star game and Miles Pabst had about seven female coaches on each arm. And he was just talking Texas to him, but he's the OU coach. And I had a hard time breaking into that group because Miles had a big big jump on me at Oklahoma, and he really got Oklahoma volleyball going. Uh, and it hasn't been the same since since his time there. So um, um, I, I think this is a real challenge. But I'm excited that it's Jason because he's a builder. That's what I like. And he doesn't seem to be intimidated. So uh, I think his volleyball, if you've watched all of his teams, they play the game well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, how do you guys feel about both staffs, the people that uh, that they brought in? Well, it sounds uh, like Aaron, you know, when, when he was building his staff, he basically, his priority was getting people he knew, he trusted, and he and he felt comfortable with. So he brought his whole staff out out with him. Uh, but I think it's important, as, as you, you know, everyone's identified, he's got to find a way to be recruiting in North Texas while he's playing in Indiana and, and you know, uh, be able to make those connections. Yeah. Yeah. When they look at Alfie, I mean, he took two Midwesterners that, uh, you know, they're moving into the big 10. So they probably have a pretty good read on what the recruiting looks like over there. And uh, yet he has the West Coast uh, background right now, being at USD and has a little bit of a, and that the identity of him growing up there. So he's got the connections there. And I thought it was smart, at least that you bring in one from the Midwest as you're going in, because the Big Ten will definitely start, the, the athletes in the Midwest will definitely start looking at UCLA and USC. Well, if Aaron wants to jump start it, all he needs to do is hire Ping out of, uh, Drive nation as his third assistant. Yeah, as his third assistant. And all you do is you shake your head because you can't understand a word Ping's saying. Right. You just you bring them and you hope that a couple kids like them enough to follow. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's so that's so true though. Um, now, yeah. I mean, he can do that. You've got to. You. I liked Alfie saying he wants people that connect. Yeah. But you've got to get people. This is more like basketball now. You've got to get people that run in the circles and people yeah. come because they trust them and they know they're going to have good programs. So right. this is this is going to be a hard one. I think we ought to watch this uh, uh, continually to see how Aaron navigates and how Alfie navigates because uh, they have some, uh, Alfie's in a good spot. He knows the West coast. So people want to come and getting into UCLA is, is a problem sometimes because they've had some problems with, uh, uh the UC system, letting people in. Uh, if you knew the numbers of, of, uh, uh, different nationalities that are are enrolled in the UC systems. It is amazing how that's working right now. So they have some rules on enrollment that are real interesting. You have to research that a little bit. I'm not 
uh, good enough to talk about it right now, but uh, he will have some problems there. Uh, but the expectation, what Bill said, is exactly right. The expectation is to beat Hambly, knock him out, and don't even look over there at USC at Brad Keller, who's who's actually got some horses coming this year. He's in a position to challenge Hambly in that conference. It, it, but that conference is all Stanford now, right? Mm -hmm. There's nobody else that, that that has really got a nucleus of players in the conference that can compete. So um, I think he, if he can put this together with the portal, I think the spring portal is going to be really interesting. Don't you think there's going to be some good athletes in the spring portal? Yeah, there very well could be some good athletes, but I think that you hit, I think that the, for both of these guys, it's not just that they're at programs that have expectations. It's they're at a programs that have expectations and they're about to make a major move into more competitive conferences than they've been in. <laughs> right, right. And I mean, if you, Kathy knows, if you play in the Big Ten, I mean, every Wednesday night, the tenth place team can freaking beat you. Yep. I mean, LSU's got some of the best athletes playing volleyball in the country at that place. I mean, Kentucky, Arkansas, with their BYU head. Coach, I mean, there are some really good. There, they are going from from kind of mid-sized conference to huge conferences where there's going to be off balance. And one year you've got a schedule where you're playing every good team in the conference mm -hmm. and none of the weak teams in the conference. I mean, this is going to well, be a real like we're gonna have to have, We're going to have to have these guys back on again and <laughs> do a six-month check and see how we're doing. Yeah, we need next December as soon as their season's over. Okay, guys, let's count your gray hairs. <laughs> <laughs> or if you have any hair. <laughs> or if you have hair, yeah. like, <laughs> if you'd be right, lucky so, enough to uh, have hair. Let's like talk that. about uh, next week before we sign off here. Yeah, we're uh, we're working on getting um, the NIL Network founder on. Um, she is trying to free her schedule up to get us on next Wednesday. So we will post that as soon as we know for sure. Okay, great. And, and I think, well, either way, we're going to have a, NIL, uh, you know, show for next week. And hopefully it'll be the young lady you're talking about uh, because we do need to get some more experts on, though it is nice having the coaches on and getting little tidbits from them. And you know, I was kind of surprised that, that UCLA has 145 businesses in their collective already. I don't, th Bob, I don't think that's a collective. That's, mm -hmm. I think uh, the 145 schools is just probably in some form of contacting where the athletes can go sell themselves. They, the athlete puts their name and the company can look at their picture. I in, think, yeah, yeah. yeah I, a collective is a That's an influencer thing. Yeah. 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 So we have to be careful. It is a collective of companies, but it's not a collective. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of coaches out there that want to figure out like, hey, how do we leverage this? How do we make this work for our school? And I think there's a lot of questions. So it'd be great to have her on if we can get her. Well, she's going to ma mainly talk about the athletes. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, definitely. But either way, it, we got, it's, it matters. Yeah. All right. Next <laughs> All right. time, it's time for us to sign off. I got cool. I got to go. So you guys you can later. stay. <laughs> well, put your sunglasses on. <laughs> I yeah, think as we're right. bundling so up, I've got my next week right here. <laughs> on, on Master Coaches Wednesday Weekly Buzz. Headed to Lake Thunderbird right now. See you later. All right. I'm going the same way. Uh